This was in an area called Wellawada, a prime residential area in Colombo. We stood on the railroad tracks that ran between my friend's house and the beach. The tracks are elevated about eight feet from the water line normally, but at that point, the water had receded to a level three or four feet below normal. I'd never seen the reef here before. There were fish caught in rock pools left behind by the receding water. Some children jumped down and ran to the rock pools with bags. They were trying to catch fish. No one realized that this was a very bad idea. The people on the tracks just continued to watch them. I turned around to check on my friend's house. Then someone on the tracks screamed. Before I could turn around, everyone on the tracks was screaming and running. The water had started coming back. It was foaming over the reef. The children managed to run back upon the, onto the tracks. No one was lost there, but the water continued to climb. In about two minutes, it had reached the level of the railroad tracks and was coming over it. We had run about 100 meters by this time. I continued to rise. I saw an old man standing at his gate, knee deep in water, refusing to move. He said he'd lived his whole life there by the beach and that he would rather die there than run. A boy broke away from his mother to run back into his house to get his dog, who was apparently afraid. An old lady crying was carried out of her house and up the road by her son. The slum built on the railway reservation between the sea and the railroad tracks was completely swept away. Since this was a high-risk location, the police had warned the residents, and no one was there when the water rose, but they had not had any time to evacuate any belongings. For hours afterward, the sea was strewn with bits of wood for miles around. All of this was from the houses in the slum. When the water subsided, it was as if it had never existed. This may seem hard to believe unless you've been reading lots and lots of news reports. But in many places after the tsunami, villagers were still terrified. When what was a tranquil sea swallows up people, homes, and long-tailed boats mercilessly without warning, and no one can tell you anything reliable about whether another one is coming, I'm not sure you'd want to come down either. One of the scariest things about the tsunami that I've not seen mentioned is the complete lack of information. This may seem minor, but it is terrifying to hear rumor after rumor after rumor that another tidal wave, bigger than the last, will be coming at exactly 1 p.m., or perhaps tonight, or perhaps... You don't even know if it is safe to go back down to the water to catch a boat to the hospital. We think that Phi Phi Hospital is destroyed. We think this boat is going to Phuket Hospital, but if it's too dangerous to land at its pier, then perhaps it will go to Krabi instead, which is more protected. We don't think another wave is coming right away. At the Phi Phi Hill Hope Resort, I was tucked into a corner furthest away from the television, but I strained to listen for information. They reported there was an 8.5 magnitude earthquake in Sumatra, which triggered the massive tsunami. Having this news was comforting in some small way to understand what had just happened to us. However, the report focused on what had already occurred and offered no information on what to expect now. In general, everything was merely hearsay and rumor, and not a single person I spoke to for over 36 hours knew anything with any certainty. Those were two accounts of the Asian tsunami from um, two internet blogs that essentially sprang up uh, after it occurred. Um, I'm now going to show you two video segments from the tsunami that, that also were shown on blogs. I, I should warn you, they're pretty powerful. One from Thailand and then the second one from Phuket as well.
Those were both on this site, waveofdestruction.org. In the world of blogs, there's going to be before the tsunami and after the tsunami. Because one of the things that happened in the wake of the tsunami was that, although initially, that is in that first day, there was actually a kind of dearth of live reporting. There was a dearth of live video. And some people complained about this. They said sort of, you know, the, the blogsters let us down. What, ha what became very clear was that within a few days, the outpouring of information uh, was immense. And we got a complete and c powerful picture of what had happened that in, in a way that we never had been able to get before. And what you had was a group of essentially unorganized, unconnected writers, video bloggers, et cetera, who were able to come up with a collective portrait of a disaster that gave us a much better sense of what it was like to actually be there um, than the mainstream media could give us. And so in some ways, the tsunami can be seen as a sort of seminal moment, a moment in which the blogosphere came to a certain degree of age. Now, I'm sort of going to move now from this kind of the sublime in the traditional sense of the world, that, that is to say awe-inspiring, terrifying, to the somewhat more mundane. Because when we think about blogs, I think for most of us who are, are concerned about them, we are primarily concerned with things like politics, technology, etc. And I want to ask three questions in this talk, in the 10 minutes that remain, about the blogosphere. The first one is, what does it tell us about our ideas about what motivate people to do things? The second is, do blogs genuinely have the possibility of, of accessing a kind of collective intelligence that has previously remained, for the most part, untapped? And then the third part is, what, what are the potential problems or the sort of dark side of blogs as we know them? OK, the first question, what do they tell us about why people do things? One of the fascinating things about the blogosphere specifically, and of course the internet more generally, and it's going to seem like a very obvious point, but I think it is an important one to think about, is that the people who are generating this enormous reams of content every day, who are spending enormous amounts of time organizing, linking, commenting on the substance of the internet, are doing so primarily for free. They are not getting paid for it in any way other than in the attention and to some extent the reputational capital that they gain from doing a good job. And this is, at least to a traditional economist, somewhat remarkable. Because sort of the traditional account of economic man would say that, you know, basically you do things for, for a, a concrete reward, primarily financial. But instead, what we're finding on the internet, and one of the great geniuses of it, is that people have found a way to work together without any money involved at all. They have come up with, in a sense, a sort of different method for organizing activity. Uh, the Yale law professor Yokai Bankler, in an essay called uh, Coase's Penguin, talks about this sort of open source model, which we're familiar with from Linux, as being potentially applicable in a whole host of situations. And you know, if you think about this with the tsunami, what you have is essentially a kind of army of local journalists who are sort of producing enormous amounts of material for no reason other than to tell their stories. That's a very powerful idea, and it's a very powerful reality. And it's one that offers really interesting possibilities for organizing a whole, whole, a whole host of activities um, sort of for, down the road. So I think the first thing that the blogosphere tells us is that we need to expand our idea of what counts as rational. And we need to expand our simple equation of value equals money, or you have to pay for it for it to be good. But then, in fact, you can end up with collectively really brilliant products without any money at all changing hands. There are a few bloggers, somewhere maybe around 20 now, who do, in fact, make some kind of money, and a few who are actually sort of trying to make a full-time living out of it. But the vast majority of them are doing it because they love it, or they love the attention, or, or whatever it is. So you know, Howard Rheingold has written a lot about this, and, and I think is writing about this more. But this notion of voluntary cooperation is an incredibly powerful one, and one worth, worth thinking about. The second is question is, what does the blogosphere actually do for us in terms of accessing collective intelligence? Um, you know, as Chris mentioned, I wrote a book called The Wisdom of Crowds. And the premise of The Wisdom of Crowds is that under the right conditions, groups can be remarkably intelligent. And they can actually often be smarter than even the smartest person within them. The simplest example of this is that if you ask a group of people to do something like guess how many jelly beans are in a jar, you know, if, we, if I had a jar of jelly beans and I asked you to guess how many jelly beans were in that jar, your average guess would be remarkably good. It would be somewhere probably within 3 and 5% of the number of be 
beans in the jar. And it would be better than 90 to 95% of you. Uh, there may be one or two of you who are brilliant jelly bean guessers, but um, for the most part, uh, the, the group's guess would be better than just about all of you. Uh, and what's fascinating is that you can see this phenomenon at work in many more complicated situations. So for instance, um, if you look at the odds on horses at a racetrack, they predict almost perfectly how likely a horse is to win. Uh, in, in a sense, the, the group of betters at the racetrack is forecasting the future in probabilistic terms. You know, if you think about something like Google, uh, which essentially is relying on the collective intelligence of the web to seek out those sites that have the most valuable information. Uh, we know that Google does an exceptionally good job of doing that, and it does that because collectively, this disorganized thing we call the, the World Wide Web actually has a remarkable order, a remarkable intelligence in it. And this, I think, is one of the real promises of the blogosphere. Dan Gilmore, whose book, We Media, which is included in the, in the gift pack, has talked about it as saying that as a, as a writer, he's recognized that his readers know more than he does. Now, this is a very challenging idea. It's a very challenging idea to mainstream media. It's a very challenging idea to anyone who has invested an enormous amount of time in expertise and who has a lot of uh, energy uh, invested in the notion that he or she knows better than everyone else. But what the blogosphere offers is the possibility of getting at the kind of collective distributed intelligence that is out there and that we know is available to us if we can just figure out, uh, figure out a way of accessing it. Each blog post, each blog commentary may not in and of itself be exactly what we're looking for, but collectively, the judgment of those people posting, those people linking, more often than not is going to give you a very interesting and, and enormously valuable picture of, of what's going on. So that's the positive side of it. That's the positive side of what is sometimes called participatory journalism or citizen, journal citizen journalism, um, et cetera. That in fact, we are sort of giving people who have never been able to talk before a kind of voice and we're able to access information that, that has always been there but has essentially gone untapped. But there is a dark side to this and that's what I wanna spend the, the last part of my talk on. One of the things that happens if you spend a lot of time on the internet and you spend a lot of time thinking about the internet is that it is very easy to fall in love with the internet. It is very easy to fall in love with the decentralized bottom-up structure of the internet. It is very easy to think that networks are necessarily good things, that being linked from one place to another to being tightly linked in a group is a very good thing. And much of the time it is. But there's also a downside to this, a kind of dark side, in fact. And that is that the more tightly linked we, we come to each other, the harder it is for each of us to remain independent. One of the fundamental characteristics of a network is that once you are linked in the network, the network starts to shape your views and starts to shape your interactions with everybody else. That's one of the things that defines what a network is. A network is not just the product of its component parts, it is actually a product of, it, it is something more than that. It is, as Steven Johnson has talked about, an emergent phenomenon. Now, this has all these benefits. It's very beneficial in terms of the efficiency of communicating information. It gives you access to uh, a whole host of people. It allows people to coordinate their activities in very good ways. But the problem is that groups are only smart when the people in them are as independent as possible. This is sort of the paradox of the wisdom of crowds or the paradox of collective intelligence, that what it requires is actually a form of independent thinking. And networks make it harder for people to do that because they drive attention to the things that the network values. So one of the phenomenons that's very clear in the blogosphere is that once a meme, once an idea gets going, it is very easy for people to just sort of pile on because other people have, say, a link. People have linked to it, and so other people in turn link to it, et cetera, et cetera. And that phenomenon, that phenomenon of kind of piling on uh, the, existing the existing links is one that is characteristic of the blogosphere, particularly of the political blogosphere, and it is one that essentially sort of throws off this kind of beautiful decentralized bottom-up intelligence that blogs can manifest in the right conditions. The metaphor I like to use is the metaphor of the circular mill. 
A lot of people talk about ants. You know, this is a conference that's inspired by, by nature. When we talk about bottom-up, decentralized phenomenons, this sort of ant colony is a classic metaphor. Because, you know, no individual ant knows exactly what it's doing, but collectively, ants are able to reach incredibly intelligent uh, uh, decisions. They're able to sort of reach food as efficiently as possible. They're able to uh, uh, guide their traffic with remarkable speed. Um, so the ant colony is a great model. You have all these little parts that collectively add up to, to a great thing. But we know that occasionally ants go astray. And how, what happens is that if army ants are sort of wandering around and they get lost, they start to follow a simple rule. Just do what the ant in front of you does. And what happens is that the ants eventually end up in a circle. And uh, there's this famous example of one that was 1,200 feet long and lasted for two days. And the ants just kept marching around and around in a circle until they died. And that, I think, is the sort of thing to watch out for. That's the thing we have to fear, <laughs> is that we're just going to keep marching around and around until we die. Now, I want to connect this back, though, to the tsunami. Because one of the great things about the tsunami, in terms of the blogosphere's coverage, not in terms of the tsunami itself, is that it really did represent a genuine bottom-up phenomenon. You saw sites that had never existed before getting huge amounts of traffic. You saw people being, offer up, being able to offer up their independent points of view in a way that they hadn't before. And, it, and there, you really did see the intelligence of the web manifest itself. So that's the upside. The circular mill is the downside. And I think that the former is really what we need to strive for. Thank you very much. Some may call it an obsession. At Rolex, however, the pursuit of excellence is a passion. Finding the perfect steel for our watch cases was just one more challenge. We found it. It's called 904L. A steel so incredibly difficult to machine that special equipment had to be built. Only one watchmaker would consider using it. Rolex. To ensure lasting beauty, Rolex demanded a steel with maximum resistance against corrosion. Previously used only in the chemical industry, 904L easily met these demands. Virtually indestructible and highly polishable, 904L's quality guarantees the perfect brilliance of a Rolex watch case. Which helps explain why, at Rolex, we treat steel as if it were a precious metal.